Start in verse 20, Exodus chapter 8. <clears throat> Last time we did our Bible study in Exodus, we saw <clears throat> that the plagues had begun. And we saw that God is getting ready to begin His work. He is he's in the process of doing His work to bring His people out of bondage, and He's going to do it in a spectacular way. And it takes ten plagues, He uses ten plagues, and we said that they escalate in severity as we go. Uh, the, the first three plagues, even the children of Israel were affl- aff- afflicted and affected, if we remember that. They were included. They were not outside of the effects of those plagues. And uh, this, this is kind of a reminder that since we're in the world, we're going to have to put up with some of the, the nuisance in the world. Uh, but we won't suffer the same way those without Christ will suffer. And uh, eternal suffering versus temporal suffering is what it is. Uh, The first three plagues that we saw are just really annoying. Uh, They don't really cause loss or long-term harm. The first plague we saw was they turned the water into blood. The second plague was the frogs all over the land. And, uh, you know, that doesn't sound so bad until you really think about frogs everywhere. And it even said it would be in their ovens. That's pretty gross, you know. And uh, waking up frogs everywhere, going to bed frogs. That was just, I don't know if I could do it. But the third one was lice, and we said that's like swarms of gnats everywhere, and just all over man and beast. And uh, we know how annoying just a little bit of gnats can be all over you, let alone swarms everywhere. And so those first three, God's just kind of getting their attention. He's annoying them, he's stirring them up a little bit, and uh, he's, he's trying to just to get a hold of them. So now... We're going to look tonight at the fourth plague and the fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh plagues. And things start to change a little bit with what God does with these different plagues. The whole idea of what we're seeing, and especially tonight, the picture's becoming a little clearer, that man's rebellion is costly. When man rebels, it's very costly. I wonder tonight, has there been a time when we've rebelled, and we can look back and see where it cost us. Or I wonder tonight if if maybe one of us would even find ourselves in a time where maybe God's speaking to our heart and we're just choosing to say no, disobey. And we have to understand that man's rebellion is costly. Has there been a time when we've been rebellious and it's cost us? You know, tonight we're going to see the grace and the patience of God and how he gives us ample opportunities to repent. Now, while, men's, while our rebellion is costly, God is gracious, God is long-suffering, and he does give us time and opportunity to repent. Let's look at this tonight in Exodus chapter 8, and beginning in verse 20. Exodus eight twenty, The Bible says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Rise up early in the morning, And stand before Pharaoh. Lo, he cometh forth to the water. And say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. Else, if thou wilt not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies upon thee, and upon thy servants, and upon thy people, and into thy houses. And the houses of the Egyptians shall be full of swarms of flies, and also the ground whereon they are. And I will sever in that day the land of Goshen, in which my people dwell, that no swarms of flies shall be there. To the end thou mayest know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth, and I will put a division between my people and thy people. Tomorrow shall this sign be. And the Lord did so, and there came a grievous swarm of flies into the house of Pharaoh, and into his servants' houses, and into all the land of Egypt. The land was corrupted by reason of the swarm of flies. And Pharaoh called for Moses and for Aaron, and said, Go ye, sacrifice to your God in the land. And Moses said, It is not meet so to do, for we shall sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians to the Lord our God. Lo, shall we sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians before their eyes, and will they not stone us? We will go three days' journey into the wilderness, 
and sacrifice to the Lord our God as he shall command us. And Pharaoh said, I will let you go that you may sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness. Only you shall not go very far away. Entreat for me. And Moses said, Behold, I I go out from thee, and I will entreat the Lord that the swarms of flies may depart from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from his people tomorrow. But let not Pharaoh deal deceitfully any more in not letting the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. And Moses went out from Pharaoh and entreated the Lord, and the Lord did according to the word of Moses. And he removed the swarms of flies from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from his people. There remained not one. And Pharaoh hardened his heart at this time also, neither would he let the people go. So we see that man's rebellion is costly. And we see that even in this instance, God is gracious and long-suffering. But now the plagues have turned up a notch. Now the plagues were just annoying, but now they're starting to see pain and loss. In verses 20 through 23, God makes a distinction again. He draws a line between the world and his people. Notice how he says that in verse 20. He says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Rise early in the morning, stand before Pharaoh. Lo, he cometh forth to the water, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. Else if thou wilt not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies upon thee, and upon thy servants, and upon thy people, and into thy houses. And the houses of the Egyptians shall be full of swarms of flies, and also the ground wherein they are. And I will sever in that day the land of Goshen, in which my people dwell, that no swarms of flies shall be there. All right, so he says, now, Pharaoh, I'm going to cut my people off from you. And the, the, the plagues, the flies in this instance, are going to affect you and your people, but my people aren't going to deal with, the, with this one. God is now ramping up the plagues. They're becoming worse in nature, and they're also, God has made a distinction between his people and the people of the world. I'm glad to know tonight, and I'm glad to remember and be reminded that God knows who his people are. And God knows where his people are. You know, God knows where we're at, and he knows that sometimes he's going to make a distinction, and he's going to sever, and he's going to not make us have to deal with some of the things the rest of the world's going to have to deal with. I mean, you think about it. If we're living the way we ought to be and we're being God's people and we're not doing drugs and we're not drinking alcohol and we're not smoking cigarettes and we're not out living uh, lives that are sinful lives, you know what? We're going to be severed from some of the consequences that the world is suffering. That's one of the blessings of truly being one of God's people. When you're saved and you live like you're saved, you're not going to deal with some of that junk. The Bible says in Proverbs, the way of transgressors is hard. You know, and and when we choose to live in the world and act like the world and be like the world, that's a hard way to live. But when we're being God's people and we're his and we're separate, you know what? There's a distinction there. We're not going to deal with some of the junk that the world has to deal with. I'm glad God chooses sometimes to put a line in the sand where only, well, he will allow only his people to suffer so much. And then he's, and then he stops it. You know, misery loves company. You know that. Misery loves company. A lot of times if we're down, everybody else needs to be down. If we're losing, everybody else needs to lose. You know, uh, if, if things aren't going great for us, man, we're hoping that some, somebody else is suffering too, you know. Misery loves company. But, you know, maybe we should live lives to where if we're having a rough time, we're going through a bad patch, or if, even if we're choosing to sin, that we wouldn't afflict other people with that as well. That we wouldn't choose to put ourselves with people and hurt them as well. You know, as God's people... There needs to come a time where we're severed. Sometimes God will separate, but sometimes we need to choose to separate. But I'm glad to see here that God has drawn a line, and his people will only go through so much. In verse 24, the flies do come, as God said they would come. And then after the flies come, Pharaoh offers a compromise. And uh, one of the things I learned early in life, and this is so weird, you're going to think this is so crazy, I was probably... 10 years old, 9, 10 years old, and my dad and I were watching the Jerry Lewis telethon, all right? And we've always, we've all seen that, you know. And uh, if if you're young, you're like, what in the world's that? Okay, well, 
Trust me, it was cool. And uh, Jerry Lewis, you know, he'd, he'd have all these inspiring stories about uh, muscular dystrophy and how kids were trying to fight it, and how he was trying to raise money to, to fight it. And, and he would have the, remember the, the, the running total, and he'd say, all right, let's see how much we've collected. And boy, you'd gl be glued to the television. At least I was. I thought that was intriguing. And I'd love to see that go up. I even remember one time I got some quarters, and I went up to UDF and put it in the MDA thing, you know, just to see. I knew we weren't going to count it then, but anyway. Uh, but I was glued to the TV this day, and me and my dad were watching it. And one of the guys from the Dukes of Hazard was on there. And he was talking, and because it was the guy from the Dukes of Hazard I was watching, you know, I was interested in what he said. And I remember him saying this. His son had a health issue. I don't know that it was uh, muscular dystrophy, but his son had a health issue. And he said, I remember praying to God, God, I pray that you would heal my son. And if you heal my son, God, I'll do A, B, C, D. And I remember he looked at the camera and he said, I learned something. He said, I learned that you can't deal, you can't make deals with God. You can't compromise with God. He calls the shots. And I've never forgotten that. Even just as a kid, I was watching that. I've never forgotten that message that day from just an actor on television who had some spirituality somewhere where he said, I learned a lesson from God that I couldn't make deals with him. And here's Pharaoh trying to make a deal. He's trying to make a compromise with God Almighty. And so he, he proposes a compromise. Hey, I'll let you go, but don't go real far. Okay, uh, go, go, go make your sacrifice, do whatever you're going to do, but don't go too far. We've got to keep our eyes on you. Now, there is always a, the temptation for compromise in serving God, isn't there? I mean, unless you're by nature just a cantankerous person, you like confrontation, and you want to make people mad, and you want to say, oh, yeah, watch this. By nature, I'm not that way. I hate confrontation. I don't want to make people mad. I would rather just go with the flow instead of, you know, cause trouble. But you know what? We can't compromise in serving God. That's one area that we should not compromise. But there's always a temptation to do it. And in verse 20, 28, look what Pharaoh says. He says, And I will let you go that you may sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness, only you shall not go very far away. You know what he said there? Basically he said, Don't go too far. Don't go too far. You know, most of the time, the world could care less how much you and I love and serve the Lord. As long as we're just keeping to ourselves and we're going to church and we're reading our Bibles and we're praying and we're not bothering them, they couldn't care less if we're serving the Lord or not. But sometimes you'll get a backslidden Christian who will see another Christian who's trying to live for the Lord and they'll start saying things like, eh, you're just going too far. You're taking that too far. You go to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, man, back off a little bit. Do you think God really wants you to go that much? I mean, do you think God really doesn't want you to drink any alcohol? I mean, come on. You know, sometimes you'll get a backslidden Christian who doesn't like the fact that somebody might be trying to live for the Lord, and they'll say, don't go too far. Don't, don't take that to all the lengths you want to take it to. You know, when we see a picture of Pharaoh telling Moses, you can go, but don't go too far. But that's not what God had asked Moses and the people to do. God had asked them to go three days' journey. And Moses brings up to, to Pharaoh, he says, listen, he said, if we don't go far, what we're going to do is going to be an abomination to your people. The animals that we're going to sacrifice are abomination to your people, and they'll kill us if they see us doing this. So we have to go three days' journey. We have to get way out of sight or else your people are going to kill us. And he says, go, but don't go far. You know what? God, when God wants you to go, you need to go all the way. Don't compromise. When he asks you to do something, see it through. Don't stop short. And God wanted Moses and the children of Israel to go three days, and they needed to do that. Well, Moses prays to the Lord, and the flies go away. But as we saw in verse 32, the Bible says, Pharaoh hardened his heart again. So that is the fourth plague. As we continue to move, you'll see the plagues escalate. Plague number five, starting in chapter 9, verse 1. Then the Lord said unto Moses, Go in unto Pharaoh and tell him, Thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, Let my people go, that they may serve me. For if thou refuse to let them go, and wilt hold them still, behold, 
The hand of the Lord is upon thy cattle, which is in the field, upon the horses, upon the asses, upon the camels, upon the oxen, and upon the sheep. There shall be a very grievous murrain. And the Lord shall sever between the cattle of Israel and the cattle of Egypt. And there shall nothing die of all that is the children's of Israel. And the Lord appointed a set time, saying, Tomorrow the Lord shall do this thing in the land. And the Lord did that thing on the morrow. And all the cattle of Egypt, all the cattle of Egypt died. But of the cattle of the children of Israel died not one. And Pharaoh sent, and behold, there was not one of the cattle of the Israelites dead. And the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and he did not let the people go. Now you're starting to see some loss here. It went from annoying things like frogs everywhere. Now all the cattle, and you saw the list there, horses, camels, donkeys, sheep, all of them died in Egypt. That's some serious loss. That is huge loss. That's everything. That's their strength. That's their food. Every bit of it died. Gone. Serious loss here for Pharaoh. So God makes a distinction again. Remember, the, the Israelites, there's, none of theirs died. Not one, the Bible says. Not even a fluke, you know. Not one died, but all of Egypt. God made a big distinction this time. But notice this. Look at verse 6. It says, And the Lord did that thing on the morrow, and the cattle of Egypt died, but of the cattle of the children of Israel died not one. Not one. He set, he made a specific line in the sand. Huge distinction. But verse 5 has a very interesting phrase. It says, And the Lord appointed a set time. You know what that tells me? That tells me God gave Pharaoh another opportunity to repent. He gave Pharaoh another chance to obey. In fact, God this time didn't just say, I'm going to do it. He said, tomorrow at this certain time. I'm going to do this. Pharaoh, you have all the way up to this time to make a decision. So God gave him another opportunity. I hope we are not losing focus here of the fact that when man rebels and goes the opposite way of God, God is along the way sending signals, sending things into his life saying, stop, stop. You need to change direction. You need to quit going this way. And even times God will say, I'm going to give you an opportunity to repent. God will bring opportunity. He'll open a door for us to make a change. That's a merciful God. That's a God who will come alongside even the most rebellious man and say, I'm going to give you another chance. Here's how long you have. He doesn't have to do that, but he did that. That's a merciful and gracious God. And he gives Pharaoh a chance. And look at verse 7. I think it's interesting. Look at verse 7. And Pharaoh sent... And behold, there was not one of the cattle of the Israelites. You know what Pharaoh's doing now? God's got him thinking. God's got him thinking because he sent somebody to go see. Go see if the Israelites are really alive. Go see if their cattle are still. See if any of theirs died. See if this is a fluke. So he's checking in on it now. You, you can see the wheels turning. He's scrambling a little bit. He's a little unnerved now. And he says, go find out if that's really going on or not. He wants to see. Listen. He wants to see if God's really going to do what God said he would do. And guess what? God really does what he says he's going to do. And Pharaoh found that out. Now, Pharaoh is investigating what God's doing, isn't he? This reminds me that people are going to investigate. Listen, if our God is truly everything we say he is, if I say my God's big enough, people are going to check that out. People are going to investigate if I truly believe what I say I believe. And when they find hypocrisy, when they find that that person says that, but that's not really what they think. They found a loophole. They found another reproach to the name of God. They found another reason to step aside and say, see, that God stuff's just not for me. I mean, his own people won't back up what he says. Pharaoh's scrambling. He's unnerved. And God is showing him, Pharaoh, 
You're not messing with just anybody. You're not messing with just any God. You're messing with God Almighty. And what I say I, do, I will do, I will do. For the man who's obedient, that's an awesome thing. When God says he's going to do something, he's going to do it. Praise the Lord, you can mark it down. For a man who's disobedient, that's an awful thing. Because God will do what he says he's going to do. And Pharaoh's checking in on him now. Okay. Next plague. Verse number 8. The plague of boils. Verse 8. And the Lord said unto Moses and unto Aaron, Take to you handfuls of ashes of the furnace, and let Moses sprinkle it toward the heaven in the sight of Pharaoh. And it shall become small dust in all the land of Egypt. It shall be a boil breaking forth with blains upon man and upon beast throughout all the land of Egypt. And they took ashes of the furnace and stood before Pharaoh and, and Moses sprinkled it toward, up toward heaven. And it became a boil breaking forth with blains upon man and upon beast. And the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils. For the boil was upon the magicians and upon all the Egyptians. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and he hearkened not unto them as the Lord had spoken to Moses. We see another change here. We see it escalating again. Just the sixth plague. What I want us to notice in verse 10. Look at verse 10. It says, And they took ashes of the furnace and stood before Pharaoh. Guess what? This time, God gave Pharaoh a front row seat. God let Pharaoh see right from the get-go that this was not a joke, this was not magic, this was God. He took ashes from the furnace, stood right in front of Pharaoh, threw it up in the air, and it became a boil. And soars all over man and beast. Only the Egyptians, not God's people. Covered with sores. And I read today that, the, the, I guess, the Hebrew language there even talks about it being a, a running sore. That kind of the idea it gives there. So we're not talking about just a couple bumps on you that you scratch a little. We're talking about grossness here, okay? Grotesque. Just nasty. And it's on the Egyptians. And, 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 and Pharaoh had a front row seat as to what's going on. But there's something interesting here, and I know you caught it. I emphasize it in verse 12. It says, And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh. Now, at first glance, we would think, now that seems a little unfair. That God would now get up in, in Pharaoh and say, Now I'm not going to allow you to repent. Because it says the Lord hardened his heart. Why would God harden somebody's heart? I mean, isn't he doing this to break Pharaoh? Why would he get to the sixth plague and then say, I'm not going to let you repent? See, I thought God was a good God. Why would he do that? Well, first let's notice, first thing we need to notice is this has nothing to do with salvation. Okay? This has something to do with a choice that Pharaoh had to make that had nothing to do with salvation. Okay? So God doesn't tell certain people, you're not allowed to be saved and you are allowed. That's not, what, that's not what we're saying here. This is not salvation. This is a choice that Pharaoh has to obey or rebel. First, thing, first observation. Second, what the Bible means here about God hardening his heart is that God didn't make Pharaoh disobey, but rather that God confirmed Pharaoh's will. To say it like this, God said to Pharaoh, okay, have it your way. If that's how you want it, I'm going to turn you over to your will. That's what God told Pharaoh. He didn't say, I'm not going to let you repent. Now you've crossed the line. No, he said, if that's how you want to be, I will allow your will. You know, that's not unusual for God to do that. Keep your finger there and turn to Psalm 106. Psalm 106. This is something that God would do with even His own children. Look at Psalm 106 and verse 13. 
Psalm 106, 13. Speaking of the children of Israel, it says, They, that's the children of Israel, soon forgot his works. They waited not for his counsel, but lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert. Look at verse 15. And he gave them their request, but sent leanness into their soul. So even the children of Israel got to a point in the wilderness in the desert where they lusted so much and they, they griped so much and they coveted so much that God finally said, I'm going to give you your request. I will give you what you want. And he gave them what they wanted. But look what it says in verse 15, the second part. But sent leanness into their soul. We can go our own way. And we have a free choice. We have our own will. We can choose to go the opposite way of God and get what we want. But there will be leanness in our soul. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man. But the end thereof are the ways of death. We can go our own way. We can say no to God. But there will be leanness in our soul. That, that part of our body that communes with God, there will be leanness. And God will allow it. He'll get to a point where he will allow it. He did with Pharaoh. He did with his own people. Are we stubbornly asking God for something that's not good for us tonight? Is there something that we're fighting God for that we know is not good for us? Is there something that we just can't let go of that we know God wouldn't have, but we're going to fight for it? Be careful. Sometimes God lets us go our way. Sometimes He'll confirm our will. Be careful. There will be leanness of the soul. The end thereof are the ways of death. If we enjoy being with the Lord and spending time with Him, He will give us the right desires. Psalm 37, 4. Delight thyself in the Lord, and He shall give thee the desires of thy heart. <clears throat> that doesn't mean that He'll give you whatever you want. That means he'll put the right desires in your heart if you delight in him. We get to making bad decisions with grave consequences when we go away from God. All right, next plague back into Exodus chapter 9. Exodus chapter 9, beginning in verse 13. Plague number 7. Exodus 9, 13. And the Lord said unto Moses, Rise up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, Let my people go that they may serve me. For I will at this time send all my plagues upon thine heart, and upon thy servants, and upon thy people, that thou mayest know that there is none like me in all the earth. For now I will stretch out my hand, that I may smite thee and thy people with pestilence, and thou shalt be cut off from the earth. And in very deed for this cause have I raised thee up, for to shew in thee my power, and that my name may be declared throughout all the earth. As yet exaltest thou thyself against my people, that thou wilt not let them go? Behold, tomorrow about this time I will cause it to rain a very grievous hail, such hath not been in Egypt since the foundation thereof, even until now. Send therefore now, and gather thy cattle, and all that thou hast in the field. For upon every man and beast which shall be found in the field, and shall not be brought home, the hail shall come down upon them, and they shall die. So here's the warning. God says, all right, I'm drawing another line. We're going to go to another level. This time the plagues are going to affect your heart, Pharaoh. Now you're going to start to feel it. Yeah, you've had some loss. You've even lost cattle. You've lost a bunch of things. But now, notice he said cattle and servant. Now there's going to be loss of people's lives. And he's going to touch Pharaoh's heart. He's going to start to feel it now. He says, I'm going to do this. Notice the reaction in verse 20. He that feared the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh made his servants and his cattle flee into the houses. And he that regarded not the word of the Lord left his servants and his cattle in the field. So now even some of, even some of the Egyptians are catching on. 
They're like, okay, this God, he means business. And if he says, if my guys and my cattle are inside, that they're going to be okay, I'm going to try that and see if that works. I'm going to listen to this God once and see what happens. And look what it says. It says that when the people that did that, their cattle and their people were spared. So the light bulb's coming on for some of the people in Egypt that this God means business, and I'm just going to start obeying him. And it works. And all the people who still stubbornly disobeyed God, their cattle and their servants died. Now here is a basic principle. Whether you're saved or lost, here's a great principle. Everybody listen carefully. This is earth shattering, okay? Here's an awesome. If you listen to God, things will be better than they will be if you do not listen to God. Now that is earth shattering, right? That's brand new for everybody, right? That's the first time we ever heard anything like that. Things will be better if we just listen to God. And he even shows us here for, for, the, for the lost, for the world. Egypt's the type of the world. Even for the people in the world, if they'll just obey certain things, moral law, moral principles, just fear God, so to speak, things are going to be better for you than if you just decide to go the opposite way of God. So let's all learn a lesson tonight, whether we're 13 or 113, whatever we're at. Just do what God says, okay? <laughs> and things will be better. Even the Egyptians learned, some of them learned this lesson. Okay, to finish tonight, <clears throat> verses 22 through 25 tells us that terrible hail and fire destroy everything in their path. Verse 26, again, God's people are spared. Verses 27 through 30, Moses goes to the Lord to ask him to stop the plague, but now Moses is wise enough to realize Pharaoh's not going to repent. It's going to take something different. In verses 31 through 35, Pharaoh still does not repent. And here it is. Even though people are now dying, all the cattle in the land are dying. Their plants and trees were, were destroyed by the hail. All this lost now for Pharaoh. Even some servants of his are, have died. All of this is going on. Pharaoh still refuses to obey God. What's it going to take for us to obey? I mean, we're even God's people. You know, so far in these first seven plagues, we've seen God's patience. He's been incredibly patient through all this. We've seen the free will of man, that God gives us a free will to choose. We, uh, in this series, have seen just how rebellious man can be. Even when God seems to be standing in front of him, grabbing him by the shirt and shaking him, he's saying no. So tonight, why must we test God's patience? Why does it take this kind of stuff for us to listen sometimes? Am I being stubborn about something that I know God wants for my life? Is there something that God has said to me, this is what I want for you? This is what I want you to do. This is what I don't want you to do. And yet we're saying no. And then am I going to wait until God has to start taking things away in my life before I listen? See, our rebellion costs. And a lot of times it's very costly. Will we choose to obey or to go our own way. Let's, let's pray tonight. Our Father, we thank you for uh, your word. We thank you for what we've learned tonight, what we've observed from what you did in Egypt. Lord, many, many lessons tonight. I know you spoke to my heart in many different ways. And Lord, we pray that as your people, Lord, is sitting here in church tonight, every one of us would say, yeah, we want to obey. We want to do what you want. And Lord, I pray that you would give us the love in our heart for you. Give us the wisdom in our heart to learn from these mistakes, to just obey you. Knowing that when we obey you, things are just better. And Lord, I pray that you would help us all to be your people, to live like your people, act like your people, make a difference to bring you glory. In Jesus' name we pray.